people in the gallery. I'll tell you what, after the couple of years we've been through, seeing people is a good thing. Okay, at this, uh, right now, I'd like to have uh, Mr. Jones uh, do the invocation. Let's bow our heads, folks. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that you're always near us and beside us in all that we do. We ask that you be with us this evening as we consider the affairs of this, our great city. Guide us and direct us in the decisions that we make that when we leave here this evening, we know that we have done our best. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. And as a point, before we do the pledge, uh, I ask that we take a moment of silence for the victims and the families and the communities of Buffalo and New York who tragically lost so many people and yet another senseless act of violence. If we may take the time bow our heads and reflect. Thank you all very much. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all very much. Madam Clerk, do we have the roll call? Uh, yes, sir. All present, excluding um, Vice Mayor Wilson and Mr. Tower, who are both out of town. And uh, Mr. Branch had, a, had an engagement he had to get to. Thank you. I wasn't aware. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, could I have a motion for the certification of the closed session? So moved. Second. Okay, the vote is open. By a vote of eight to zero, you certify the closed session be in accordance with the motion to recess. And the record will reflect when I entered and left. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moss. Okay, now we're going to ask for certification of the formal session of April 26, 2022, special formal session of April 26, 2022, the informal and formal sessions of May 3rd, 2022, formal session of May 10th, 2022, and the special formal session of May 10th, 2022. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, vote is open. Moving along. By a vote of 8-0, to zero, you've approved the minutes as submitted. Now it's that time again for Ray of Sunshine. And Ray is going to come up and uh, once again, you know, we have a very proud legacy of Virginia Beach, a very proud history, and acknowledging some m major people that helped make us the city we are. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, sir. I want to extend a thank you to Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor, City Council members, City Manager, and Chamber guests for allowing me to stand before you once again. I am Ray Pearson Ben from the Communications Office here to present to you the very latest episode of our Nostalgic BB campaign. We are nearly halfway through our countdown to the celebration of the city's 60th anniversary in January of 2023. Clearly, we have much to look forward to, but what we're going to do now is go back, way back, way back into time to the years 1983 to 1987. If you were here in the city of Virginia Beach, then here's a look at a time that may have slipped your mind. Please enjoy Nostalgic VB. <laughs> Let's take a look at the totally awesome things that were happening in the city of Virginia Beach and made the 80s excellent. In 1983, residents were treated to the first Pungo Strawberry Festival, which featured music, fun, livestock, and the best ways to enjoy a strawberry from A to Z. I hear fresh is always best. 
In 85, the city of Virginia Beach inducted its first members into the Employee Hall of Fame, while in 1986, the city held its first Wellness Activity Day. Both of these significant events were featured in the library system newspaper, The Beam. The aquarium opened in June of 1986 as the Virginia Marine Science Museum. Years later, the aquarium expanded, tripling in size and eventually taking the name the Virginia Aquarium and Marine Science Center. We worked ourselves to death. <laughs> when we opened the aquarium on June 14, 1986, the crowds just poured in. The first year, immediately, we became the most highly attended museum in the state of Virginia. And we kept that position for years to come. I got a lot of help in terms of starting a board of trustees for a foundation, private foundation, that would support the museum. Um, some of the former city councilmen, John Griffin and Nancy Creech, most outstanding in terms of helping that get started, along with uh, former mayor and state senator Clancy Holland. So we were there for the right reason at the right time. The wrong reason is saying we need a bigger tourist attraction. That's the wrong reason to start an aquarium. What you ought to do is to find an environmental need or an educational need that it addresses. And we did that. The Virginia Beach Police Department was internationally accredited through the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, or CALEA, in the 80s, a recognition that places the department in the top 5 to 10 percent of fully accredited agencies. In 1986, history was made when John L. Perry became the first African-American person elected to the Virginia Beach City Council. Also in 86, Donna Brim became the first female battalion chief in a major firefighting operation, not just in Virginia Beach, but in the country. In 1987, the Oceanfront Area Library became the first local government agency in the area to be designated as a voter registration. The job market got a bit of a boost in the same year when the company Lillian Vernon decided to move its production center to our great city. Well, that's our funky fresh look at Virginia Beach from 1983 to 1987. If you have pictures or videos you'd like to share that captured the early days of Virginia Beach or proud reflections of what makes this city your home, we would love to hear from you. Visit vbgov.com forward slash nostalgic VB for step-by-step -step directions on how to get those pictures and videos to us. We thank you in advance for sharing. Nostalgic VB volumes one through five are now available to view on the city's YouTube channel. You can find us by searching Access Virginia Beach. Be sure to like and subscribe. And we welcome you to continue to send us those pictures, as we referenced in the videos, that capture unforgettable moments from your life and showcase our wonderful city. Just go to vbgov.com, search Nostalgic VB, and click the button that reads, Help Us Tell the Story of Virginia Beach. We look forward to sharing the images from your most memorable stories on social media. This Nostalgic VB campaign is special because it gives us a chance to stop what we're doing and look back, but it also gives us an opportunity to honor those whose lives and contributions over the years continue to move this city forward. This evening, there are three such people that we would like to honor. I would like to invite the person of the mayor's choosing to read the first proclamation, and as he gets in place, I ask that Becky Livis, a legend in her own right, please join me here at the podium to honor the man that gave her life. Uh, thank you. And um, I requested my friend and fellow council member, uh, Aaron Rouse, to do the honor of this tremendous recognition. Hi, Becky. Hey, how are you? I'm doing good. Thank you. Welcome. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is truly an honor for, to, for me to read this proclamation um, from Mr. Perry, the first African-American elected to this Virginia Beach City Council. 
and that's the youngest African American to be elected to this council. Um, again, Mr. Mayor, this is, this is truly a privilege, and I, I want to thank you um, for giving me the privilege of, of reading this, the honor. Whereas John Richard Logan Perry, who served as the first African American elected to the Virginia Beach City Council in 1986, spent the four years of his historic term as a powerful voice, speaking out for those who had yet to experience an existence where they felt seen, heard, and valued. And whereas John L. Perry used his intelligence, compassion, and optimism to fuel his 39-year career as an educator with a specialty in STEM discipline, we are fortunate that his work took him from Norfolk to the city of Virginia Beach, where he cultivated and inspired students to see themselves as agents of change for the better at Union Kinsville and Kinsville High Schools. And whereas John L. Perry inspired those around him and served the community through hard work, unwavering support, and tireless efforts to elevate the profile of the city of Virginia Beach and to enhance the quality of life for all citizens. And whereas the city of Virginia Beach has greatly benefited from the wisdom and lived experience shared by John L. Perry, he is counted among the city, city's residents and community contributors who have made Virginia Beach a unique, welcoming, and well-known place to live, work, and play. And whereas the Virginia Beach community, all within the Hampton Roads area, has have been blessed by the passionate advocacy of John L. Perry, his courage as a voice for the voiceless inspired those who were once silent to become resounding trombones on governing bodies that have the power to shape a future of limitless opportunity for all people. And whereas by exemplifying the model of citizenship and service in the city of Virginia Beach, John L. Perry has empowered other citizens to contribute their skills and talents to the community. And whereas Nostalgic VB is a celebration of Virginia Beach pioneers and residents leading up to the 60th year, 60th anniversary of our great city in January 2023. And I'm therefore, on behalf of Mayor Robert M. Bobby Dyer, <coughs> Mayor of the City of Virginia Beach, Virginia, I proclaim John Richard Logan Perry, recipient of the Virginia Beach Diamond Award, in Virginia Beach, and I call upon the citizens of members and members within government agencies, public and private institutions, business and schools in Virginia Beach to be of service for the benefit and betterment of the community so that future generations can appreciate and further uplift our beloved city of Virginia Beach. In witness whereof, I hereunto set my hand and calls the official seal of the city of Virginia Beach, Virginia to be affixed the 17th day of May, 2022. If I could, Mr. Mayor, oh, yes. I just Mr. want to, oh. yeah, Ms. Henley and I, I should say Councilwoman Henley and myself, you know, campaigned with your husband and together, you may recall, got to know your family and John over those four years. And it was a very proud moment in Virginia Beach when John got elected. And I remember he used to always say, you may recall, he would, the billboard ordinance was one of the big issues at the time. <laughs> And he used to always said, I've never seen a billboard as lovely as a tree. And he had a whole poem he used to recite. But uh, John did serve the community well. And your whole, getting to know your family over the campaign, as only a campaign can do, was a real privilege. And John served us well. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very proud of the genes that um, he passed on to me. And Mother's Day, both of my daughters indicated to me that they were proud to, for, of the genes that I passed on to them. Um, and I'll just take a moment to just say that um, as a father, what John Perry did for me that people didn't see, I think led to some of the things that have, that have made me accomplish some of the things that I did. When I was growing up, he 
uh, went to American University to be interviewed to be a student in the National Science Foundation Institute for High School Teachers. And it ended up being a job that he kept, uh, he got a job instead <laughs> of teaching in the lab at the Institute for High School Teachers. And that was because of his love of opera, that's part of it, because Leo Schubert, who was the head of the chemistry department and also the head of the uh, institutes um, for uh, science teachers, professors, and all of this. Well, what happened to me uh, the summer that I was 16, I went up and spent with him, and we ate with the Schuberts all the time. And so one evening, I was actually sitting next to Philip Frank at the dinner table. And everybody's going, Philip Frank? Well, he was a friend of Einstein's, or he, he, wrote, he wrote a book about Einstein. He wrote The Philosophy of Physics. And you know, John Perry was a physics major. But the summers that he spent at American University opened up the opportunity for me to meet many of the great scientists in this country. And that impression never left me uh, of the people that I met. And it changed, you know, being in DC and not being down here because it was still segregated down here, being there just made a whole difference in the way that I saw the world. You know, those summers were, were just wonderful. So I thank him for the personal things that he did for me just by the way he spent his summer. And then, of course, he brought all of that back to his students as well. Um, his, the broad spectrum of his learning and experience with people actually from all over the world at American University. So that's something that you don't know about John Perry that I thought I would share. Thank you so much. I'm really proud to uh, accept this on his behalf. Um, I guess he's somewhere around here. And, uh, and I know that my daughter, Cosette, is very happy and proud. And we appreciate the recognition. Thank and you Becky, so much. And Becky, can I say something? Acorns don't fall far from the tree. <laughs> you have done so much for this community, and I know your family, but you especially have just done you know, just a ray of sunshine, an eternal smile that represents the spirit of Virginia Beach by your many accomplishments, and you're still going strong. So for that, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is indeed an honor to honor good people, right? So before the person of the mayor's choosing reads the next proclamation, I'd ask that Joseph and Jack Burroughs please join me here at the podium. Thank you. Welcome and good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Well, as you know, Virginia Beach is known for strawberries. As the city council thinks the Mrs. Henley is known for strawberries and many people. So I asked her to have the privilege of reading the proclamation. Thank you. Whereas Joseph and Edward Burris and Jack Parker Burris, who stand as two of the co-founders of the Pungo Strawberry Festival in 1983, served the community through hard work, unwavering support, and tireless efforts to elevate the profile of the city of Virginia Beach and enhance the quality of life for citizens and visitors. And whereas Joseph and Jack Burris have given of their time and knowledge to help cultivate Virginia Beach into an outstanding location for many to call home and an enduring source of pride in its high standing among other large cities <clears throat> across the nation, and whereas Joseph and Jack Burris have helped establish the city as a premier coastal community by swelling the Pungo Strawberry Festival from 50,000 attendees to crowds of more than 120,000 people who can't wait to taste the festival's endless strawberry options, pet adorable animals, ride rides, shop our unique local vendors, 
and just experience the love this community proudly grows. And whereas the city of Virginia Beach has greatly benefited from the expertise and devotion demonstrated by Joseph and Jack Burris, they're counted among the city's residents and community contributors who have made Virginia Beach a unique and well-known place to live, work, and play. And whereas the community has been blessed with the unyielding sacrifice of Joseph and Jack Burris, as they have strengthened relationships with returning visitors and the citizens of Virginia Beach mm -hmm. and within the Hampton Roads area. And whereas by exemplifying the model of citizenship and service in the city of Virginia Beach, Joseph and Jack Burris have contributed to the treasured fabric of this community through their vision, skill, and faithfulness. And whereas Virgin Nostalgia VB is a celebration of Virginia Beach pioneers and residents leading up to the 60th anniversary of our great city in January 2023. Now, therefore, Robert M. Bobby Dyer, mayor of the city of Virginia Beach, Virginia, does hereby proclaim Joseph Edward Burris and Jack Parker Burris, recipients of the Virginia Beach Diamond Award in Virginia Beach, and calls upon the citizens and members within government agencies, public and private institutions, businesses and schools in Virginia Beach, to be of service for the benefit and betterment of the community so that future generations can appreciate and further uplift our beloved city of Virginia Beach. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the official seal of the city of Virginia Beach, Virginia to be fixed the 17th day of May, 2022, signed Robert M. Bobby Dyer, Mayor. Thank you, Joe and Jack. The strength of Virginia Beach artificial. You guys are going to be in the newspaper. Oh, <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> See you again today, two days in a row. <laughs> thank you, Barbara. Yes, thank you for reading that so eloquently. One more. Do they want to say anything? Oh, good, perfect. Thank you. What's his name? Welcome. Hello. On behalf of the Burroughs family, thank you for honoring my grandparents, Joe and Jack Burroughs, or as we call them, Gil and Granddaddy. My name is Joseph Burroughs Dale, the third grandchild out of the four. My grandparents have made many contributions to their Pungo community, but they are most proud of the co-founding of the Pungo Strawberry Festival. In that first year, my grandmother proudly took the title as the first honorary witch of Pungo and rode the float down Princess Anne Road that first Memorial Day weekend. Little known fact, the road was not officially closed, so the parade went down an open road with cars. I guess you could say she stopped traffic. My grandparents have so many wonderful Strawberry Festival stories, but they wanted to share a few other bits of trivia. In the first year, it was only one day. It was only a one-day event. Expected attendance was 2,000, but it ended up being 20,000. My grandfather had 200 quarts picked of strawberries, and they sold out in the first three hours. Just a little background, my grandparents were both born in families of service and good citizenship. They've been involved in the community, their church, their children's schools, often serving in leadership roles. My grandfather, Joe Burroughs, an eighth generation Virginian, was born in 1933 in his family's home right in Punga Village. The building is still standing. He graduated from Oceana High School and attended Randolph-Macon College. He joined the Coast Guard shortly after and was stationed in Wisconsin for a short while. He finished his service in Virginia Beach at the old Coast Guard Station on Atlantic Avenue. He raised grain, hogs, and grew strawberries, as his father did. 
My grandmother, Jack Parker Burroughs, was born in 1936 in Athens, West Virginia, where she graduated from Athens High School and attended Concord College. She studied education and taught the fifth grade. Another little known fact about Jack, she personally asked the vice mayor at the time, Mr. Paul Brown, a family friend, to have a stoplight installed in the intersection in Pungo, and it was up within three days. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to set that precedent. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what did they do? <laughs> they, <laughs> they, <laughs> they married in 1955 and settled in a family home next to his parents, which is also still standing, and eventually moved to their large family farm on Seaboard Road, where they resided for 33 years, and that farm is now Hand Ridge Golf Club. They have three daughters, three son-in-laws, and four grandchildren. To together, they began their life of family and community service. Just a little background on the festival. There were a handful of Pungo residents and strawberry fans who gathered together and decided we needed to celebrate our strawberry crop. My grandparents were a part of that original group. The Pungo Strawberry Festival is a nonprofit organization staffed by community volunteers. Mm -hmm. Since its inception in 1984, attendance has grown from 20,000 attendees to upwards of 120,000 attendees. The event is funded by carnival ticket sales, donations, vendor, and parking fees. Excess proceeds are given back to the community within the festival, donating over $1.3 million in the past 36 years, including college scholarships for Virginia Beach High School students and donations to nonprofits such as Rescue Squad and the 4-H. That does not include money raised by charitable groups on site. Each year, dignitaries are selected among the locals and festival boosters as honorary mayor, first lady, Witch of Pungo, and Grand Marshal. In 1993, at the 10th Annual Strawberry Festival, my grandparents served as Honorary Mayor and First Lady of Pungo. In addition to the Strawberry Festival, they've been active in Back Bay Pungo Civic League, the Pungo Village Landowners Association, and their church, Charity United Methodist, as well as the Antique Automobiles Clubs of America, the Tidewater Chapter. My grandparents are most proud of the Pungo Strawberry Festival and it, has, and it has continued to keep its vision of the founders. That vision being a small town, community-based, family-oriented festival that celebrates not only strawberries, but our city's agricultural heritage. I stand in awe of my grandparents' accomplishments and contributions to this city. They are extraordinary examples of good citizens and devoted community leaders who have countless friends and family who love and cherish them. They never miss a chance to invite folks they encounter to the festival. Lastly, my grandparents wanted to make sure it's known that there are many folks who have passed, um, some who have passed, who were part of the origin and success of the festival. Too many to name. You will not find a more devoted couple when it comes to building up the community and keeping the city's most successful and beloved festival going. They are both very honored and humbled by this acknowledgement. Thank you. Thank you. And the legacy continues. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mayor. Ray, thank you. Uh, what a magnificent job Ray and the, um, our communications and media uh, folks do to honor Virginia Beach. We have a history to be proud of, and we have a future to look forward to. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Um, just, just for a point, of, also someone told me Ray will, will, will not be with us much longer, and so I just want to thank her, as you, you already just did, for her hard work. Um, and support and making sure our city's greatest and finest are acknowledged and recognized. And so, Ray, thank you again for your contribution to our city. Now, the nostalgia is great, but now we go to a solemn part of our history. Whereas, three years ago, citizens of Virginia Beach experienced an unspeakable tragedy that resulted in the loss of LaQuinta C. Brown, Ryan Keek Keith Cox, Tara Welsh Gallagher, Mary Louise Christensen Gale, Alexander Mikhail Gusev, Joshua O. Hardy, Michelle Missy Langer, Richard A. Nettleton, Catherine A. Lucidge Nixon, 
Christopher Kelly Rapp, Bert Snelling Jr., and Bobby Williams. Whereas in the aftermath of this tragedy, people in the community and beyond called on everyone to show love for Virginia Beach. That phrase was adopted for use in a number of places across our cities, homes, businesses, schools, parks, and beyond. And whereas we will f forever remember the 12 lives lost so suddenly three years ago, and we continue to pray for all those who were traumatized by this brutal act of violence and seek uh -huh. healing. Whereas we are forever changed, but we are resilient. We continue to pledge to commit to honoring those we lost through acts of service and acts of kindness. Whereas on this third anniversary of the May 31st, 2019 tragedy, the mayor and members of city council urged citizens to remember the victims of and pledge to honor them through volunteer acts of service. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the flag of the city of Virginia Beach shall be flown at half staff in all city uh, buildings and on city grounds from May 27th through uh, sunset May 31st, 2022. Be it further resolved that the City of Virginia Beach Council pauses during this formal session to reflect <laughs> upon the tragic day three years ago and that May 31st, 2022 be recognized as Love for B VB Dedication Day, given under our hands and seals the 17th day of May 2022. And uh, we can, if we can ask uh, 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 Audra Vet Jackson to come up. And Melissa, do you want to come up too? Okay. Good evening, Mayor Bobby Dyer, to our Vice Mayor Rosemary Wilson, to um, our City Council members, our City Manager Patrick Duhaney, and other dignitaries present, including the members of the four departments represented planning, public utilities, public works, and IT. It is an honor and privilege to stand before you this evening. I am humbled to stand in the room where change and progress happens from my hometown. While I recognize it is an honor for me to be here, I am sadly here because of the tears, families, loved ones, and our community shed as a result of the mass violence that occurred on our campus on May 31st, 2019. I also stand as a representative of our public safety department, building two employees and others who continue to stand in the gap for resilience. I am just one person who makes up a cross departmental team of public servants who are diligently working to bring year three remembrance to fruition. While I recognize I am limited in my time available in front of you, I choose to take this moment to name the people who are lending their time, talent, and passion to year three. Nina Goodell from Cultural Affairs, Alice Testerman and Shelby Giles from Human Services, Veronica Covedo from the City Manager's Office, Megan Kenyon and Marlon King from the Volunteer Resources and Recovery, Anna Alfaro and Gina Gaines from Communications, Katie Sequeira from Libraries, Thomas Nicholas from Public Works, Simsy Dempson, Julie Braley, and Amy Woodson from Parks and Recreation, Mark Hayes and Shaniqua Hans, Hawkins, excuse me, from the VB Strong Center, and Vanessa Dunlap from Catholic Charities. Know that in every event planned, we do not take it lightly, but we implore for the reverence of every life that was changed that day. We hope that this year's remembrance ceremonies and events bring the community closer together and reiterate the strength of our community because only together are we resilient. Thank you. Thank you, and on behalf of a grateful city, um, I'm gonna come down and present to you, on behalf of everybody you read and so many other people, the resolution was signed by every single council person. Yeah. Thank you.
Vice and River of the Limited. And bring the team up. We are indeed a community of heroes. Okay, moving on, we get to honor and recognize some other folks. That, and I'm going to ask um, Council Lady Wooten uh, to read the uh, resolution honoring Asian American Pacific Islander Month resolution and for have Chance Wilson and Petula Moy to come on up to the uh, podium. Thank you. And as uh, they come to the podium, I would just like to really express uh, my sincere gratitude uh, to Ms. Petula Moy and uh, Mr. Chance Wilson. During the height of Asian hate, which was a truly uh, challenging and detrimental time in our history, uh, Ms. Petula Moy uh, stood up and spoke out against the hate that was perpetuated against Asian Americans in our society. Uh, she stood up, she spoke out. Her and Mr. Wilson worked together and had events to bring awareness to this very tragic uh, situation. Uh, it is now with great pleasure, I would like to read a resolution on your behalf uh, to honor Asian American and Pacific Islander Month, uh, but also to thank you for your efforts in ensuring that we keep uh, those serious issues in the forefront of our <coughs> society and we address them. Whereas Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders make up roughly 7% of the United States population and are currently the fastest growing racial group. And whereas Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders is an umbrella term that is used to include cultures from the entire Asian continent. These cultures include East, Southeast, and South Asia, and the Pacific Islands of Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. And whereas Asian American and Pacific Islanders Heritage Week initially was held May 1st through May 10th. This week is symbolic as it coincides with two milestones. The first, Japanese immigrants arrived on May 7th, 1843, and the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad on May 10th, 1869, which comprised of mostly Chinese workers. In 1992, Congress expanded the observance to a month-long celebration. And whereas throughout the years, the Asian American Pacific Islander community has endured numerous hardships, including but not limited to stereotyping as perpetual foreigners, language barriers, immigration bans, and limitations, and internment camps, thus establishing a trying journey ahead. And whereas Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month serves landmark to celebrate the generations of Asian American Pacific Islanders who have enriched Americans' history through their journeys, hardships, they have overcome and their key role in the success of our nation's future. And whereas two local groups, Benchmark LLC and Asian American Alliance Organization have collaborated in the creation of the Asian Food Month campaign. 
Their campaign seeks to encourage ongoing cultural relations efforts and celebrate Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month through its amazing food creations. Benchmark LLC was founded by Mr. Chance Wilson. Benchmark LLC focuses on business to business services, communications, and media and project development services. The Asian American Alliance organization was founded by Ms. Patula Moy for the progression of diversity and inclusion. Their mission is to collaborate with Asian, non-Asian professionals and leaders to influence diversity and inclusion through civic involvements. Now therefore be it resolved that the city of Virginia Beach, city of Virginia Beach City Council Pause in its deliberations to recognize Benchmark LLC and the Asian American Alliance organization for their efforts to promote Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month with creations of Asian food, with the creation of Asian Food Month, and their efforts promote inclusivity, diversity, and progression within our community. At this time, I'd like to present both of you with a resolution and after pictures, please make sure you have remarks. Remarks. Well, thank you um, for this recognition. It's amazing. And the story is pretty interesting how it all started. Um, I've been a business strategist for about 19 years, and Patula has been my client for almost, I think, four or five now. And uh, I remember Patula was so passionate to want to do something in the community. And uh, we kind of we, we shared the same views on how culture should come together. And unfortunately, we do not see a lot of examples of different cultures coming together. And they're out there. Um, you know, you see, uh, you know, Jewish, African-American, German. I mean, just everyone really doing something, but you don't really see it make the news. So uh, I'm a foodie and produce some, some food shows. And I said, you know, we should do something that we can really highlight the food, like of Asian Restaurant Week. And she said, no, Asian Month is, is coming up. And I was familiar with the Asian Heritage Month. I said, you know what, Asian Food Month, and then that's how it happened. And restaurants, people started nominating their favorite restaurant, and we encouraged people to go out to their local restaurant. And a big thing was support the pricing. Don't haggle with the pricing, because a lot of small businesses are hurting. You know, try to help out where you can and, and order as much as you can. And then Petula called this gentleman, I don't know if well, he was here, uh, Paul, and he's with uh, Raj Food Indian Cuisine in Norfolk, and he jumped at the opportunity to actually host um, our tasting. And once again, we, we had a cultural movement come to the restaurant, pack the restaurant, and people were talking about how can we get together, how can we join together, what can we do to kind of move things forward. And um, that's how it happened. And Petula, definitely. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, you know, uh, for the recognitions. And we really um, thankful that you're allowing Asian American Alliance to the for the commitments to the community. And I think with this project, that you know, it gives us an opportunity to just to bring people together and the cultures to benefit the community. Thank you. No, thank, thank you all you. very much. And thank you, uh, Council Lady, for, for bringing this forward. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. It. Thank you. And you know, I would just say for our close, um, one thing I would want to really encourage everyone to do, uh, especially in light of things happening in Buffalo and what's happening around the world, we need to really investigate, research, connect, collaborate, engage in any way that we can in ways that we can learn more about each other, create together, build together. We all live in the same community. 
and we have to do what we can to break down any boundaries, any bad feelings, whatever we need to do to just move forward. Because if we don't, the community won't survive. Thank you. Well, I'll be honest with you. I got uh, Councilman Rouse on overtime tonight. Yeah. Um, <coughs> as you know, Mr. Rouse had some involvement with football Just over his life. Yeah. Uh, but once again, it starts young. It starts with youth. It starts with families coming to practice and dedicated coaches and Absolutely. doing things. And we, we have a proud legacy right here. And, and uh, you know, Aaron, if you could be so kind. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is this is really an honor since I used to play against uh, Woodstock Mustangs as a kid, and they were uh, one of our tough uh, rivals playing for Cook, <laughs> Cook out there in SeaTac. And so this is this is really an honor. Um, the proclamation. Whereas Sid Pops Pearl, I love that name by the way. Sid Pops Pearl demonstrated a great investment and a commitment to the youth of Virginia Beach and Hampton Roads region through 50 years at the, as a youth football coach. And whereas Sid Pops Pearl was a great husband, is a great husband, father, grandfather, brother, friend, and coach to his family and extended family that he impacted through football. And whereas Sid Pops Pearl started the Woodstock Mustangs, and later formed the Virginia Beach Mustangs and worked with dedication, diligence, and vigor to develop young athletes into honorable, respectful, and confident adults. And whereas the passing of Sid Pops Pearl, a great member of the community, has caused a deep void in the thousands of lives that he's positively touched. And Sid Pops Pearl, whereas Sid Pops Pearl faithfully served his country in the United States Navy for 21 years, and served his community as a youth football coach for five decades. And whereas Sid Pops Pearl was loved by his family and the community that he served with a gentle spirit and desire to make a difference in the youth of our region. And whereas Sid Pops Pearl lived in such a manner to touch every person through his great example of love and acceptance. Now, therefore, I, on behalf of Robin M. Bobby Dyer, mayor of the city of Virginia Beach, Virginia, do hereby proclaim May 17th, 2022, Sid Pops Pearl Day in Virginia Beach and I as a community mourn with the family and we will attempt to improve our lives and live our lives as demonstrated by the great example of Sid Pops Pearl. And witness, Sandy Pearl, are you here? And witness whereof I have unto sat my hand and caused the official seal of the city of Virginia Beach, Virginia to be affixed the, seventh day, the 17th day of May, 2022. Yeah, just tell me when to stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot to say or not a lot. We've been married 69 years. I met him way back in New York when I was friends with his sister. And he joined the Navy because he wasn't allowed to join the Air Force because he didn't want to go in the Army. And... Uh, my father said he wouldn't let us go together if he joined the Air Force, because I had a brother killed during World War II. But he was always just him. I mean, he, uh, he started taking the kids up to football practice, baseball practice. One year, he even coached the girls' basketball team. We have one daughter. <laughs> and uh, she was 13 at the time. And he came home saying, they cry all the time. What do I do? <laughs> <laughs> he was used to yelling at boys, and he yelled. 
but he was happy coaching. He started just going down there and helping them, and then he just went up each year. And then he had all five, all four boys were coached. And that's about all I have to say. He's a wonderful man. They called him the Farmer Sid from Brooklyn. He had the best garden out there in the yard. He gave vegetables away to all the neighbors. And I got two, green, two tomato plants planted, and that's it. <laughs> but it's, we'll miss him. We miss him a lot. Sandy, you did great. Thank you. Good? Um, yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. And uh, we got Mr. Rouse batting cleanup, too. We got a multi sport today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, the one thing I think we showed, especially in the last budget, that we value our employees and the people that work here. When you have the largest city in the Commonwealth, it takes a lot to keep things going 24-7. But I think honoring you know, a special group of people, uh, and then, you know, uh, once again, uh, Mr. Rouse was very influential with uh, in the last budget cycle, as was the rest of council. But in terms of recognition. So, Aaron, if you could be so kind. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And again, thank you to this body. Um, this is a body of work. We all came together to make sure we take care of our workforce, our first responders, and those men and women in public works. So, again, thank you to this body. Whereas public works infrastructure is above, below, and all around us, we are able to have clean water, safe streets, efficient traffic, and livable communities because of public works. And whereas public works professionals focus on infrastructure, facilities, and services that could not be provided without their dedicated efforts who perform at all levels. And whereas these professionals are responsible for rebuilding, improving, and protecting our city's transportation, public buildings, traffic systems, beaches, and waterways, roads, and streets, and other structures and facilities that are absolutely essential to our citizens. And whereas public works services provided in our community are at an integral part of our citizens' everyday lives and creates a lasting impression. The health, safety, and comfort of this community greatly depends on these facilities and services. And whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff public works departments is materially influenced by the people's attitude and understanding of the importance of the work they perform. Now, and therefore, I on behalf of Robert M. Bobby Dyer, Mayor of the City of Virginia Beach, Virginia, do proclaim May 15th through the 21st, 2022, Public Works Week in Virginia Beach, and I call upon all citizens to salute the hard work, accomplishments, and commitment of these dedicated members of the Virginia Beach Public Works Department. In, 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 where, in witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and crossed the official seal of the City of Virginia Beach, Virginia, to be affixed the 17th day of May, 2022. Hey, thank you, Aaron. You know, that's great. Aaron. I think it speaks of us as a city and community when we take time to recognize our history, our present, and our future. Thank you all very much. Okay, moving on, um, public hearing. Uh, first item is to modify boundary of Herds Cove Neighborhood Dredging Special Service District, SSD. We have one speaker, Barbara Messner. Good evening. Good evening. Did you say 
uh, why Miss Wilson and Mr. Tower weren't here and Mr. Branch. I, I, did anybody say? Anyway. Herd's Cove. Okay, and I, I need to make a note that it's a violation of the Hatch Act. I don't know why you're letting all these people that are running for office have all these photo ops and videos. They can't be used on their campaigns because it's a violation. These, these meetings are not for, for candidates. Um, we have problems with uncontrolled growth. You already fail with Chesapeake and Colony. Um, it's a taxing district. If you didn't have uncontrolled growth, we wouldn't have problems with dredging. Um, we paid for five parking garages to build town center for Armada Hoffler and Devaris. And that's part of the reason for the flooding and the blight. In 2011, Mr. Moss ran on uh, fixing Princess Anne High School. I have pictures of the blight there. It's outrageous. And speaking of families, the original families were, were great. We had really great families. I lived in Virginia Beach. I was from Norfolk, so I know what the city used to be like. Speaking of families, I hope people will uh, get the book Friend of the Family by D. Leah Jacobs and Tough Enough by Billy Franklin uh, and learn about your city. And for you to not have any victim families here and to talk about the victim families when they, they still don't have any justice, May 31st. And the conflicts are obscene. This is Linwood Branch's uh, Fundraiser, $5,000. Okay, uh, Delegate Barry Knight, Mayor Bobby Dyer, Honorable Rosemary Wilson, Ken Stolle, Delegate uh, Glenn Davis, Tom Barton, George Alcaraz from Planning, Doug Ellis, Venture, Bob McDonald, Governor Bob McDonald, Cheryl McCleskey, D. Oliver, Honorable Will Sessoms. Honorable Jim Wood, John W. Wynn, um, you know, Town Bank, Town Bank, Town Bank. No wonder. Um, okay, thank, thank you, you very much. You're welcome very much. That was hard to go. Okay, I guess we're moving on, and I will now read the speaker's policy. I want to remind everyone that the city uh, council uh, speaker policy that allows certain representatives of groups to speak for 10 minutes applies only to planning items. All other speakers, whether speaking individually or on behalf of a group, will have up to three minutes to speak on a single item. Speakers are reminded that comments during the formal session of the meeting must be limited to the subject of the item that is being considered by council at that time, you are called. For items placed on the consent agenda, a speaker will have up to three minutes to address any single item. If a speaker wishes to address multiple consent items, the speakers will have a cumulative total of six minutes to address those items. Again, the speaker must limit his or her comments to the subject matter of the items that they have signed up to address. Finally, I call upon all speakers and all persons in the chamber to be civil in their discussions and decorum. Whatever views you hold and want to express, the City Council wants to hear from you and to ensure that all viewpoints and all persons are respected the best way to do this for us to strive for civility and respect. Okay, we have ready to speech. move forward. Barbara Messner. There are two items pulled from the consent agenda. 
J2A and J8A. J2A. Can I know if any speakers are here for the fish? J2A and J8A are pulled from the consent agenda. Okay. Um, J2, and what was the other one? I'm, I'm trying to make notes. J8A. J8A. Okay. Like I said, I've lived here a long time. I know what the city used to be like. To see everybody all dressed up, all these parties and all the money for elections, it, it infuriates me. Like I said, um, we have flooding. We have major problems with infrastructure that haven't been taken care of. Debbie and Prevento talked about uh, the Thalia area. That was supposed to be fixed like five years ago. Um, modify the boundary of Herd's Cove. Neighborhood dredging special service district SSD removes seven properties and authorize the refund of SSD levies. Okay. I oppose. I oppose the way you run our government and give people credit. I mean, the Strawberry Festival, ARP, that affects Miss Henley. You know, everybody who's running for office that does all this grandstanding. Okay. Um, five. Authorize and direct city manager who works for you, who's, you know, everybody reads. You don't, you don't even talk. If you read, even Moss reads script. Um, city manager ex execute memorandum of agreement, establish and maintain Virginia Beach Conservation Assistance Program with city and Virginia Dare Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, you, you run the government as a dictatorship just because we speak, you know, and then you have other people speak. We don't really have a voice. You do what you want with air money, air land, air parking, and air police. We would not have crime if the police were allowed to do their jobs. They were complaining in the 90s being pulled from other districts. Now you want to lower the standards and hire other people? If you took care of the ones you had and, this, and the people in uh, Building 2, we wouldn't have had mass exodus of people leaving. Okay. And this is another reason uh, Wilson and Tower probably aren't here. Um, $164 million. A uh, residential care facility. They have a waiver, a medical waiver. Um, Westminster Canterbury, uh, revenue bonds. Why are we helping a wealthy, wealthy uh, private retirement community? Okay. Um, ordinance to donate 40 ballistic vests to the Virginia Association of Chiefs of Police and Foundation, Inc. You know, it was 2017 when they were supposed to, when there was 300,000 uh, for the uh, body cams. They weren't implemented. Every excuse under the sun. You're not taking care of the police. A lot of them have low morale and they're hanging in there until they can leave. But uh, instead of having parties on the beach and competing with Norfolk, air police should be on the streets preventing crime. Okay. Um, I want to skip to this one because huge amount. 20 million appropriate, basically 21 million from federal and state funding, schools, Categorical Grant Fund. 
and a half a million uh, for the aquarium. The aquarium is, is self-sufficient. It's for tourism. They don't, they have events there. You have parking for them from uh, Camp Pendleton. All these, they have boat trips. They have overnight parties. You don't take care of the animals there. It's just, it's tourism. We should not be funding these things. We should not have $3.3 billion debt. That means you're all malfeasance, guilty of malfeasance. Okay. Um, and modification um, for drive through What Chick-fil-A does and some of these other restaurants is discrimination, and it competes unfairly against the uh, brick-and-mortar restaurants. You have to have an app and a phone and a car to get food. We don't have a pandemic if you're having parties all over the place. And, you know, like I said, this, this is crazy the way you, as RK used to say, you pick the winners and Thank the you. losers. Appreciate it. Thank you. But he doesn't show up anymore. Okay. Uh, Mr. Jones? You'd be so kind. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move for approval under the consent agenda, first under ordinances and resolutions, item J1, which is ordinance to modify the boundary of Herds Cove neighborhood dredging <coughs> special service district. Uh, Ray removes seven properties and authorize a refund of special service district levies. J2, ordinances to amend, or uh, ordinance, ordinance to amend city code section uh, B10.10-1, 10, 10 Ray changing polling locations for the June 2022 primary election, Buckner Precinct to Rosemont Elementary School and Trantwood. Uh, precinct to Trantwood Elementary School. I understand we have speakers on the first part of that? Yes, sir. Okay. Item uh, J3, which is ordinance to authorize the acquisition of property in fee simple and acquisition of temporary and permanent easements either by agreement or condemnation. Ray Elbow Road extended phase uh, 2C project CIP uh, project number 100159 formerly CIP uh, number 2-124 item 4 ordinance to authorize and direct the city manager to execute a deed of release and exchange ray and ag agricultural reserve program uh, land preservation easement located on the land of Vanguard Landing, Inc. Item 5, resolution to authorize and direct the city manager to execute a memorandum of agreement to establish and maintain the Virginia Beach Res Conservation Assistance Program between the city and Virginia Dare Soil and Water Conservation District. Item 6 uh, is the ordinance to approve the sale of a portion of the school board property for the city's West Neck Road Phase 4 project and allow the school board to retain the sales pro sale proceeds. Uh, the clerk would please note that Mr. Moss is abstaining on that item. Okay. Item 7, this is a resolution to approve the issuance of residential care facility revenue bonds up to 164 million Ray Westminster Canterbury on Chesapeake Bay, uh, and clerk would please uh, note that I am personally abstaining on that item. Yes, sir. Okay. Item eight, ordinances to authorize temporary encroachments into a portion of the city owned A or B property known as 
2973 Heron Ridge Drive and the city maintenance easement located at the rear of 2937 Couples Court, Ray 2 bulkheads and a deck, District 2, formerly District 7, Princess Anne, and C, property known as Treasure uh, Canal located at the rear of 2232 Windward Shore Drive, Ray construct and maintain a boat lift Wood, wood Dock, Wood Pier, and Six Wood Piles, District 8, formerly District 8, Lynn Haven. <clears throat> Item 9, ordinance to donate 40 ballistic vests to the Virginia Association of Chiefs of Police and Foundation, Inc. Item 10, ordinance to increase appropriations by $1.35 million to the Fuels Internal service fund and authorize city manager to transfer funds from a city manager's pandemic reserve for fuel costs to various departments uh, and clerk will please note mr moss is voting no on that item yes sir item 11 which is ordinances to appropriate uh, a Twenty million nine hundred seven thousand six hundred and seventeen dollars from federal and state funding to fiscal year 2021-22 schools categorical grants fund. And the clerk would please note that Mr. Moss is abstaining on that item. Yes, sir. And 11B, four hundred and fifty thousand in revenue to the fiscal year 2021-22 department of the Virginia Aquarium operating budget Ray additional expenditures related to Virginia Aquarium gift shop. Open the public hearing on planning. Under planning, uh, item K1, which is uh, the application of Atlantic Development Associates, Associates LLC and WPL Ventures LLC for a variance to section 4.4b of subdivision regulations for a subdivide two lots at a uh, 111-73rd street district uh, 6 and uh, uh, formerly district uh, 5 and that's to defer to the first meeting in august item uh, K2 under planning sacred daggers LLC Percy Lee Jones jr. Family trust for a special exception for alternative compliance rate tattoo parlor at 1705 Mediterranean Avenue district 6 formerly district 6 Beach uh, item 3 RVB 3 comma LLC for a modification of proffers to conditional change of zoning for a drive through only restaurant at 5453 Wesleyan Drive, District 4, formerly District 2, Kempsville. Item 4, Baking It, Caking It, LLC, Brianna Small, for a conditional use permit, Ray Home, Occupation, Commercial Kitchen, Bakery, at 4500 Hollingsworth Lane, District 2, formerly District 1, Centerville. Item 5, uh, Enterprise Leasing Company of Norfolk, Richmond, LLC, ET Enterprises, LLC, for a conditional use permit, Ray Motor Vehicle Rentals at 1112 uh, Lynn Haven Parkway, District 3, formerly District 3, Rose Hall, Item 6, Car Spa, Inc., General Booth Venture Group, LLC, for a conditional use permit rate car wash facility at the northeast corner of General Booth Boulevard and Prosperity Road, District 5, formerly District 6 Beach. Item 7, Nora Nimley, for a conditional use permit rate family daycare at 1712 Moon Valley Drive, District 5, formerly District 3, Rose Hall. Item 8, Waterman Spirits, LLC, Festival, LLC, 
for a conditional use permit for a craft distillery at 712 Atlantic Avenue, uh, District 5, formerly District 6 Beach, Item 9, Christopher and Kathleen Sprower for a conditional use permit for a short-term rental at 2200 and 2202 Mediterranean Avenue, District 6, formerly District 6 Beach. Item 10, Coastal Accommodations, LLC, 22 East Neptune, LLC for conditional use permit for a short-term rental at 410 22nd Street, Unit B, District 6, formerly District 6 Beach. 11, item 11, Georgie Stoyanov for a conditional use permit for a short-term rental at 4005 Atlantic Avenue, Unit 115, District 6, formerly District 6 Beach. And for deferral for 60 days to July the 12th, ordinance to amend section 111 of the CZO to add terms related to energy storage facilities, ordinance to add section 225.02 to the CZO to add requirements to energy storage facilities, ordinance to amend sections 1001 of the CZO to include energy storage facility as a use permitted with a conditional use permit in the I-1 and I-2 districts uh, sponsored by Vice Mayor Wilson and deferred from April the 5th, 2022. Okay, so is, there a, okay is there a motion? I so move. Okay, second. second. Okay, discussion. Votes open. Go ahead, vote the vote here. By vote of eight to zero, you have read the consent agenda as read by Councilmember Jones. Okay. Uh, was one of the items for no. discussion and one of the voting polling no. items? I need to yes. explain my abstention and my negative, my no vote. First of all, my abstentions on item J6 and item J11A are driven by a Commonwealth attorney opinion that since that deals with a singular agency for a singular action by this council, that since my wife is a school teacher, that I'm unable to vote. I know that's new, but that opinion previously had not been shared until January 18th of this year in regard to another council member, but it applies to me. I have appealed that to the Attorney General through the uh, Senator Bill DeStuff, but that has not yet been resolved, so I'm abstaining on that question, on those two issues. My no vote on item 10, which was the appropriation of $1.35 to the Fuels Internal Service Agency. Today we received a finance briefing which shows that our departments, specifically with labor, are all under-executing their accounts by a substantial amount. And since most families, matter of fact, 40% of all American families can't find $500 to pay for anything, um, my, uh, I believe that these funds should first come from within the departments uh, the fuel issue isn't caused by the pandemic, number one, and no one, no one can, there's plenty of documentation as to that, and I think that should be reserved for the category purposes that it is, cost driven by the pandemic and not by worldwide events and energy policy in the United States. And therefore, I think that the departments, just like families, should be finding those assets and we should have made the appropriate reappropriation from those surplus accounts into the general fuel account rather than using the pandemic reserve, and I voted no. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yes. I'd like to explain that I abstained on item, uh, or under ordinance and resolutions, item mm -hmm. seven pertaining to Westminster Canterbury on Chesapeake Bay, because at the time of the rezoning, I, I abstained on that item because I had a conflict of interest at that time. Good. Barbara? Uh, I I would like to make a few comments about the request by Vanguard Landing to readjust the ARP boundary. Uh, this was very routine and it needed to be approved. However, how we got here is not routine and I would just like to offer some background because I think the background for this very worthy project has been lost. I guess it's been a little over 10 years now since I was approached by a then new nonprofit group named Vanguard Landing that was looking for some property to create a special community where adults with mild to moderate intellectual disabilities could realize their full potential. 
and have this place to live, work, and play. It needed to be a property that was served by utilities and would be suitable to build a community for houses, as well as described in a brochure, quote, situated on beautiful acreage filled with walking trails, gardens, and orchards, is also home to rescue companion animals, horses, shops, and classrooms, and filled with innovative educational, vocational, and recreational opportunities in a least restrictive yet secure environment. Well, that was a tall order, but we looked at several properties that just were too expensive until this property was discovered, <clears throat> and it has its own special background. This property was originally owned by a wonderful lady named Louise Williamson, who loved the land that she had inherited and wanted it to stay as farmland. When she passed away, it was divided among her children. One parcel was sold to our firefighters union, which since then had been put on the market for resale. One daughter built her house on her parcel, and the other daughter, following in her mother's footsteps, enrolled her parcel in the Ag Reserve program so that even though this is in the transition area, it would stay farmland. But then the daughter who had built her home there suddenly passed away. Well, that was when it was realized that perhaps this property could be reassembled to its original farm property status. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> it became apparent that this would be an ideal property for Vanguard Landing's plans. Coming up with the money to make the purchase was a problem. And so the then city manager and then mayor and I discussed the possibility of making an interest-free loan to Vanguard, which we do just as we do for rescue squads, and to allow Vanguard to pay the city back in installments. And that is what was presented to city council on November 26, 2013. On November 10, 2013, the City Council unanimously appropriated $2,910,000 to the Virginia Beach Development Authority to provide a loan to Vanguard Landing for a mixed-use facility for persons with intellectual disabilities. The loan would be repaid on a 25-year amortization schedule with payments commencing at the beginning of year 8, which is 1922. I mean 2022, and a final balloon payment due at the end of 15 years. On March 11, 2014, the City Council unanimously approved the necessary rezonings and the necessary exchanges of ARP property to accommodate the plan. But things do happen, even for the best laid plans. It was also at that very time that the city began its extensive studies of stormwater and sea level rise because we had recognized that there were problems in our systems. Also, in 2016, Matthew happened. Some of the worst problems of flooding occurred at Asheville Park and Sherwood Lakes. The Vanguard property is smack between these two developments and directly adjacent to Asheville Park. Vanguard's engineer, Bob Miller of MSA, recognized the seriousness of the problem and advised that they wait to design their stormwater plan until the city had determined the new ordinances which were sure to come. But Vanguard continued on with their fundraising and their other permits that would be required for a loan. Other unforeseen circumstances also developed. We all know how committed Bob Miller was to serving people with intellectual disabilities and how strongly he supported Special Olympics. But he also had his own medical issues and fought that battle. Tragically, he passed away before he could see this project completed. We know the city was also dealing with enormous issues in 2019, and we all dropped the ball on the Vanguard issue. With the approval of the rezoning in 2014, there had been a couple of conditions. One was that a single house would have to be built within five years. Clearly, when it became obvious that that condition could not be met because the site <coughs> plan could not be responsibly approved until the new stormwater design standards were met and approved, we should have modified that condition whether it should have been realized by the planning department, 
by economic development and the development authority, by the applicant, or maybe by me, we all dropped the ball. And for that, I apologize. <clears throat> then 2020 came with the pandemic. Everybody was affected, nonprofits enormously so. We realized that, and we made much of the CARES Act funding available to nonprofits, but not to Vanguard. Instead, in 2021, Vanguard was roundly chastised and penalized for not meeting a standard that was not possible to meet. They were required by the Development Authority to pay $500,000, a half a million dollars, I suppose, as a penalty, and were given until this coming June to come up with the balance. Well, by the way, they paid the first installment on time that was due from the original requirement by the City Council of 114,000 some odd dollars in February of this year. And now they are looking at a deadline this June for the balance. I would hope that the Development Authority would give Vanguard the same consideration that is routinely given to others, <clears throat> that they be given an extension <coughs> until at least the end of this year so they can complete their site plan requirements and get their loan. They are not asking for special privilege. They just want to be treated like everybody else and be given an extension to be able to achieve their performance requirements because of unforeseen circumstances. Better yet, and this is just me, I would ask that they be allowed to return to the original repayment schedule that was set down by City Council, because the City Council keeps its word. I would just like to see this very worthy project to serve exceptional people be able to be completed. And as the district representative, I would welcome this community to be in Princess Anne. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Henley. Mr. Mayor. Okay, yeah, Mr. Bellucci. I'd like just to make a, a quick comment, if I may. Of course, I have the highest respect for um, Councilwoman Henley, and, and I admire her dedication to the project. Um, and since this was a routine discussion, I didn't prepare remarks, so I'm going to try to choose my words very carefully here. But um, I don't think that the uh, description that was offered by Ms. Henley tells the full scope of the story. Um, I know many people who are in the, um, in the field of serving um, uh, people with intellectual disabilities who have great concerns about the model <coughs> that Vanguard Landing is, is um, using um, because the U.S. Department of Justice and the Commonwealth of Virginia have guidelines and mandates about how we serve people with intellectual disabilities because uh, for the very reasons that were stated, we want people, all people, to reach their full potentials their full potential, and concentrating individuals who live with um, intellectual disability into one place is problematic and, and possibly dangerous for their care. So that's one element. And um, I'm not prepared to speak on the financing now because I would like to do a little bit more research on that. But there is um, concern from people I know who have spent their entire professional career who are award-winning, nationally recognized advocates for people with disabilities about the model of Vanguard Landing. And I think we owe it to people with disabilities to have that discussion here before we uh, make any further concessions to Vanguard Landing. And I would, I would request that. Well, I would just like to say that it's unfortunate that this was not said back in 2013-14 when the City Council unanimously approved this at the urging of the uh, human resources development at that time and they have to get all their permits and approvals through the state, from the state, which they are doing and have done. They will be getting a, a loan through Virginia Housing, and I would really hope that we could have an honest discussion about what is out there, because I think it's pretty unfair that these people have been, um, I, I think, perhaps, uh, not treated in the fashion that they should have. And I appreciate your speaking out, finally, because I think maybe it's been uh, alluded to that they somehow were in default of their loan, and that was the issue. So if there's really some other issue, we need to talk about it. There is. And I, I really think that perhaps it would be a good idea if you and I go down together and look at all the, the, the process that they have gone through 
uh, through the state and through all of the uh, permitting agencies to get the permits that they're required. Thank you very much. And if I could suggest this, uh, two things. Number one, Mr. Bellucci and Ms. Henley do get together, and uh, but the other thing is the possibility is of, of us storing a council uh, you know, workshop discussion, you know, to have a full vet vetting and uh, discussion on this. Mr. Moss. I just want to follow up on one thing Mrs. Henley said, and I think the financing issue is another story. But I, but you've heard from me many times, you know, council should keep its word, you know, and I think that is important, and I think it takes a very high threshold for us to be able to explain to the public why commitment that we made unanimously maybe everybody wasn't here at the time that commitment was made but the body made it as an institution and I think we have an obligation to sustain that without some uh, material impact that we can discuss later but has not yet been presented okay great about this point the vote is open uh, on on the consent no? it's already you've already done the consent, oh, on the consent. my apologies okay now moving on um, yeah, we're going to go to ordinances uh, 2A, and that would be 630 fishing on the northern section of the beach during the resort season at Little Island Park. We have two speakers, Barbara Messner, and after Ms. Messner is Sarah Gerloff. I resent the hell out of not being able to speak on all items while y'all speak. I'm very informed on Vanguard Landing. Mr. Moss and Mr. DeSteth, I helped y'all. I thought it was they were going to do the funding, not, not the taxpayers. Not the taxpayers. Okay, and um, the fishing. It's discrimination. To, um, to pander to tourism and not let people fish. There's hardly anything healthy and safe for people to do in the city. And it was like 10 seconds on that vote. We can't see it if it's 10 seconds. Still super majority vote. Um, Vanguard landing, it, you really want to know, myself and other people have researched it and are familiar with it, I would be more than happy to give it to you. I appreciate the fact that you're challenging it. You know, these people all voted for it, but there's plenty of people that can give you information. None of this behind the scenes all vote in lockstep. Short-term rentals I've spoken about for a long time, since 2016. Uh, could you please stick to the items? I'm again? sticking to the items that I was not allowed to speak no, on. No, I already, no, I, no. I did. I'm going to finish. Uh, I'm talking policy. about due process. Uh, Chevron X. She only the item at hand. Okay, you change a speaker's policy, which is a violation of my free speech. Chevron, Exxon, and BP are the reasons that Moss should abstain, and he was part of Vanguard Landing. He shouldn't be talking about it. Thank you. Sarah Gerloff. Good evening. Good evening. I will begin with some reason. My reason for speaking is multifaceted. I speak in hopes that you will learn something from my words, and I speak because I care, among other reasons. We can only change ourselves, but we have the ability to inspire others to change. There is a depth to my words, so please pay close attention and think deeply about the meanings of my words. Once again, I will point out that we have unalienable God-given rights to life, liberty, property, and pursuit of happiness, and that no one is to infringe upon these rights. These rights are not to be diminished in any way by requiring a license, a fee, or a tax. By requiring a license and restricting access to fishing, you are once again infringing upon our rights. We have equal rights to the property, since it is our land. It is our liberty to decide what we want to eat from the bounty Mother Nature has provided for us in order to sustain life. Some choose fishing in their pursuit of happiness. 
Since the true government is one of consent, I do not consent to the restriction of access to our rights to fish. Each one of you has been entrusted with the very important job of protecting the people's rights and to treat everyone equal under the true law. Ask yourselves, how have you personally stacked up to the task? Have you treated the people equally under the law, under the true law? Have you protected their unalienable rights? Bobby, a few weeks ago, you tried to declare this board has integrity. Do you know the definition of integrity? Well, let me tell you. It means to stand up for what is right and true, which this board clearly does not do. Let me give you an example of integrity. Barbara Messner is an example of integrity. That's integrity. You are not. It is clear that you do not act like council members that follow the true law. You are council mem members entitled only, with an entitled mentality to go with it. You have become transparent, ghosts of your former selves because you have compromised yourselves with your choices. Remember, if you cheat your lessons on your lessons, you have only cheated yourselves. You have caused harm to many over the years with your choices. As long as you refuse to accept that it is each one of you that is the cause of the problems we now face, as long as you refuse to take responsibility for your actions, then you will not change and hope remains lost for you. That's all the speakers, sir. Okay, do we have a, mo a motion of Ms. Henley? I think you want to uh, right. talk about a revision. Right, we did revise this slightly just to uh, clarify what it was saying, and I think you all have a copy of it now. Uh, it's changed that this is the, the way it was, that at Little Island Park from the northern property line bordering the sanctuary con condominiums southward to 1,400 feet from the southern property line bordering the Back Bay Wildlife Refuge during the resort season between the hours of 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. on weekdays and 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. on weekends and holidays during the resort season. This did not delineate that last during the resort season, so it would be plain. But it just means that you can't fish from the sand beaches at the times when those beaches are filled with children and everybody swimming and, and so forth in the water. And I think there was some misunderstanding before that maybe we were uh, impacting the pier fishing, but no, that's not impacted at all. This is just from the beach right there at Little Island Park uh, during those hours in the resort season. And so I move approval. Second. second. Move and second <coughs> discussion. Votes open. By a vote of eight to zero, you have approved the ordinance. Okay, now that we're, the, we're Amanda, was there something on the polling that? No, sir. Okay, we're been good on that. Free back and say, yes. Okay, uh, so now we're moving on to uh, J8A. Okay, the right of way known as Sam Fiddler Road, adjacent to 2445 Sam Fiddler Road, will retain uh, 12 four inch wood posts deferred indefinitely from December 7, 2021, uh, District 7. <laughs> We have two speakers, Robert Finley. And after Mr. Finley is Barbara Master. <clears throat> good evening. Good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, Council, uh, Council, Mr. Mayor. I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this evening uh, concerning the posts that are encroaching on the city property on the right of way that are uh, just uh, inland from the road about a foot. Uh, I had the opportunity, uh, this was supposed to come up uh, uh, last fall before you. Uh, before it came up, I asked uh, uh, Ms. Henley uh, if I could speak to her about it. And uh, in, in regard to that, she arranged a meeting with uh, city staff, uh, members of the engineering department, and we had a very pleasant meeting on the 19th of November. Uh, at that meeting, uh, after the pleasantries were uh, exchanged, uh, Ms. Henley did not speak or participate in the uh, discussions. Our discussions, uh, of course, uh, were about the post, and it was also about the, the state of Virginia Beach 
or the Sand Fiddler Road itself. Um, at the end of the discussions, uh, I made the uh, offer to cut the posts down, which were originally uh, from 24 inches down to about 12 inches height, down to four inches. Uh, uh, that uh, that uh, offer was accepted uh, by the two staff members at present, and one of them uh, made the aside comment that their whole objective was to ensure maximum safety and eliminate all risks to either vehicle traffic or persons that are walking on the road and coming off the road. So that brings us to the point where on, we're at now. The city staff has recommended that uh, we have uh, uh, two options for the written agreement that I'd have, we'd have to enter into, my wife and I, uh, with the staff. One of them that would have a uh, requirement for us to obtain insurance on the risk that the city uh, gets from having these residual posts post and way and one uh, one of the uh, agreement without that uh, that requirement for insurance uh, I want to point out that uh, we disagree with the city's recommendations for the insurance uh, because we comply the post cut down comply with all the guides guidelines for road construction even if they have a, a uh, clear zone or uh, recovery area. I also want to point out that by city, by uh, state law, we have a pure contributing negligence rule, which thank means. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, Ms. Could, could you uh, just allow him to finish that one sentence? Because I think it's important what he feels. If you want to just finish the sentence. Yeah, go right ahead, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, the 100% uh, or the pure contributing negligence rule means that. Uh, as I understand it, that uh, one party has to be 100% at fault, or within Virginia law, you're, you're not liable. So, in my my position is that a driver that allows his vehicle to exit the road uh, has some, at least, minimal uh, responsibility for that or liability for that. Therefore, the other party would not have any under Virginia law. Could not be held liable for it. Well, and and you know the whole legal thing. I have to look to our city attorney to, to explain, because it's just our policy. I think I'm right at this. If we do give someone uh, the right to encroach in our right of way, we, this is just a requirement that we have, that the city has is is not held liable if anyone is injured in that. But I'm going to let. Mr. Stiles answer it better than I. Yes, Mrs. Henley. The, uh, the requirement has always been that the person who is encroaching into the city's property, the city's right-of-way, provide indemnity and insurance in the event that their encroachment were to cause a loss or an injury and the city were then sued for that because it is the city's property. Now, it's a policy decision. You can make, this council can make a decision not to require that. But one, that would be the first time, at least in my experience as your city attorney, that you would have ever done that, and you will be establishing a, a new precedent. And two, although um, uh, the gentleman is partially correct on the issue of contributory negligence, contributory negligence is a bar, I can envision scenarios where an injury could occur that would not involve negligence on the part of the driver, and the driver would therefore have a claim that could be brought both against um, uh, the encroacher and against the city. So my recommendation is that you should continue to require uh, the insurance. But again, it is, a, it is a policy issue for the council to decide. I would like to say something. In my, in my research for this, I asked for information on a property along our road, a multi-family multi, uh, dwelling that uh, is on uh, Sand Fiddler and borders also on Marlin Drive and Sandbri Sandbridge Road. And in that uh, site plan for that uh, site plat, uh, they had 
curbing, and that curbing has been installed. Uh, I don't believe that's the only curbing that exists on Sand, Sand Fiddler Road or on Marlin Drive. And uh, as a result of that, uh, when I asked for the information on it, uh, I was not provided any information that, that that property owners there are required to uh, have insurance on that privately. I, I think I think we would, if we look at it, we will find out so. But I think what we could do tonight is is approve this as it is recommended by staff, and that is you'll be allowed to keep the uh, encroachment. Well, you would allow to have this encroachment provided that you do uh, uh, maintain the liability insurance. However, we will certainly look at what you have provided us here because this is how our inspectors don't go out and look for encroachments, but when there are complaints, that's when they investigate right. them. I, so in, we will certainly make certain that these are all well, investigated. And I, I, do, I don't want to be run out of Sandbridge on a, <laughs> well, a tarred and feather, <laughs> okay? Uh, you know, it's my opinion that the, the road there, as a legacy road, there's no expectation for the public uh, that there would be clear zones or recovery areas. Many courts have held that uh, when that has come up, when a car has run into a tree uh, off the road or something like that. Well, uh, I think we will uh, we'll, we'll appreciate that and right. and um, move, I would suggest we move forward with this. But if you still are not comfortable in signing it, then you certainly don't sign it. And we will have to pursue. Um, okay. I, for, okay I'll, thank you, sir. Uh, okay. thank, thank you, you so much. It. I think there's another speaker. We have one additional speaker, Barbara Messner. Um, you're commercializing everything. You've destroyed the quality of life at Sandbridge. Um, we can't use our, our public beaches. They're all commercialized. You have events and parties um, at the pier. You want to restrict um, when people can fish. Um, Kathy Miller's group, since 2016, asked for help. You know, you have event houses there, and you have huge motor coaches that drive through. And if you look around the city, all these huge trucks delivering products everywhere because it's uncontrolled growth, they run over everything, the street lights, the, um, you know, it doesn't matter if you give right away to somebody you're still liable. You are liable. And the city does, does not have sovereign immunity. If you look into the Institute for Justice, um, they've gone to the Supreme Court. You cannot just arbitrarily do whatever you want. And then, Ms. Henley, people can complain after the fact. I, shame on all of you. You've destroyed our city, and you're destroying the livelihood of people who have a history here and want to protect their quality of life. That's all the speakers, sir. Okay. Oh, do we have a motion in a second? Well, I didn't know if anyone else had any questions. Uh, I, any other I've, discussion? Yeah. Well, I'm. I just have a question, okay. Ms. Pena. Is, is the motion to approve it with Nothing. insurance or without insurance? Well, it's not made yet, but that's oh. what I was getting ready to <laughs> okay. see. I didn't know if the rest of you had any questions or any insight. I certainly don't think I'm, I'm certainly not prepared to do anything that's going to uh, establish a new precedent in the city. And I think if this has been the policy and we've followed it for everything else, I think we have to continue to follow it, which is what uh, approval of this ordinance would do to keep our policy that uh, any encroachment in the city uh, right away must have um, uh, insurance or liability insurance to protect the city. 
However, if we find out otherwise, then we'll, we can reconsider this at some other time. <coughs> but at, at this time, I would um, move that we approve the ordinance as presented. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Any other discussion? Votes open. That was wrong. By a vote of eight to zero, you've approved the ordinance. Okay. At this point, uh, do we have any old business? Ms. Wooten? Oh, okay. Uh, we do have appointments. Okay. My, my apologies. Sure. I do a matter of business. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to nominate to the Arts and Humanities Commission Susan Grube and Winsh Winship Tower to the Bikeways and Trails Advisory Committee, Mark Horton to the Minority Business Council, Tara Jones. to the Social Services Advisory Board, Jelana McCaslin, to the Tidewater Community College Board, Barry Brown, to the Tidewater Youth Services Commission, Olympia Perkins. Mr. Jones, um, I think you missed the Eastern Virginia Medical School I'm sorry. The Eastern Virginia Medical School, which is on page two, that's one of the ones that was nominated last time too. I sure did. Thank Eastern you. and to the Eastern Virginia Medical School, Philip uh, Euclid. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Votes open. I'm missing somebody. By a vote of eight to zero, you have appointed those read by Councilmember Jones. Hey, any old business? Yes, John. Just one item, since it was in the budget, and I've spoken with the city manager, just this is the appropriation that was made without any specifics with regards to council assistance. So I would hope between now and July 1st, when that appropriation that some of you all voted for, that either a, since it's an at-will employee, I'm certain that we consider it at our next meeting how that is going to be addressed and who who on the 10 is going to form the committee or whatever to bring back what the concept of operation is at so we know what, how we're going to appropriate that, what are the lines of accountability for how the dollars are expended and keeping track of time. There's a lot of mechanical aspects of that. And so I just want to make sure that, that we have that on our agenda and someone has that as a task. I don't think we can ask the staff to tell us how we want that to work since they work, would work for us, I guess, at will. So I just hope that we have that on our council workload. Okay, thank you. Ms. Wooten, any new? Uh... Yes, I, I would like to um, recognize uh, Mr. Chris Flowers. Can you come up, Chris? Come on up, Chris. Chris um, has been interning with me quite some, some time now. And um, some of you, I'm sure many of you have met Chris. But this is his last uh, meeting with us. And he recently graduated from Regent University with his uh, gra graduate degree in politics and history. And he's working on his graduate certificate, which is wonderful in uh, terrorism and homeland defense at Regent University. But he's leaving us here uh, and going on to Richmond. He's going to be interning in, in the 2022 Governor's Fellowship Program. And so I just want to say thank you, Chris, for all your hard work. You worked diligently on the Citizens Review Board, doing research with me, uh, and being here, being a, a part of the meetings, and just being very supportive. So congratulations to you on your, your graduate degree and your promotion to the governor's office. That's the one. <laughs> Regent is a pretty good school. Yes, sir, it is. Good stuff. <laughs> Been there, done that. Hey, thank you. At this point, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.